it's an interesting question. Um, you know, all he he has basically disappeared all of his potential rivals or people who thought were in some way a threat to his power, including his wife, Shelley. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to Ramacro. I have the pleasure of inviting back to the channel a trusted friend, uh, someone who I admire greatly, someone who has been through an awful lot and continues to shine a light on terrible abuses within his former religion. It's an absolute thrill to invite back Mike Rinder. Hi, Lloyd. Nice to be back. <laughs> it's brilliant to have you on, Mike. You are now, th there's a, a been a big change since the last time you were on the channel, because you are now author of a book. And if Tibor is gracious, we will show the cover of this book. The, the title is A Billion Years, My Escape from a Life in the Highest Ranks of Scientology. Now, as it happens, I don't have a copy yet because it's actually quite complicated to get books that aren't by Jordan Peterson here in Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, you should have told me I would have mailed you one. No, 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 no. I insist on buying it myself. Um, <laughs> but I, I will be buying I will definitely be buying it. And I do have some reviews that I'd like to read out. So um Kirkus summarized your book as an intensely personal, cathartic memoir of blind allegiance, betrayal, and liberation. And simonandschuster.com uh, says, in a billion years, the dark dystopian truth about Scientology is revealed as never before. Rinda offers insights into the religion that only someone who is former rank, high rank could provide and tells a harrowing but fulfilling story of personal resilience. And Scientology.org commented <laughs> mike rinder smells of old socks and his book is not very good at all please don't read it so <laughs> uh that's that's very apropos Lloyd. very very <laughs> but just for, for legal reasons i have to say that last quote was made up because we know what they're like but yeah um so uh, well it it may not have been made up it could it was could very it, realistic it wasn't it was <laughs> we can't I mean, say for sure is yeah who knows you, Maybe. <laughs> you know they put out a a summary of the book before it was published and oh. summarized it in a book that they tried to to trick people into buying on amazon a book summarizing a book that hadn't been released yet exactly and oh. people and and I found out about it because people started writing to me saying, I ordered this book. I thought I was getting like a pre-release copy of the book. And it turns out it's it's just a uh like a 40-page bunch of garbage published by Scientology that has nothing to do with the book. It's just all oh, what a rotten person you are. So Yeah. <laughs> it must get exhausting though, mustn't it? I mean, you've done this job. You are former international spokesman of the church of scientology and you were also its head of its head of its special office of special affairs that's a weird name isn't it yeah um, special ever these aren't just normal affairs we're not just we're not just talking about <laughs> regular affairs here these are special affairs um but you you this was your job at one point wasn't it it was your job to to denigrate you know, the opposition. And it must be exhausting, as in this case, to to write 40 pages of just utter negativity. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but that's their job. And that, you know, they think those those um minions toiling away in the Office of Special Affairs think that this is uh, in some ways, saving all of mankind. They are contributing to the effort to prevent um, people like me from stopping Scientology, from achieving its objective, uh, you know, or the stated objective, at least, of, of a world without war, without insanity, where 
honest beings have rights and man is free to rise to greater heights. Mm. You know, Scientology, uh, Hubbard put out these very sort of altruistic sounding things that were the objectives theoretically of Scientology. And, you know, good Scientologists believe that they are working diligently to accomplish those ends. And they're very laudatory. Laudatory. They they sound wonderful. The problem is um, that's not what really is being accomplished. And instead, the end result of Scientology is people with no money or put in, you know, filing for bankruptcy and broken up families and people who are suffering mental and uh, abuse. And, you know, all of that sort of goes by the, the, it's not that it goes by the wayside. It's like, it's ignored and explained and justified with this idea of the greater good. You know, we are the only hope for saving every man, woman, and child on earth. And in, in many respects, the, you know, we've talked about it many times, Lloyd. The similarities between the Jehovah's Witnesses and Scientology is pretty remarkable. Not in, not when you get down to the sort of nitty gritty, we believe this or we believe that. It's these big picture concepts of we're the chosen people. We're going to save every man, woman, and child on earth as long as we can persuade them that they need to join up with us mm. and believe what we believe and act like we act. And that the abuses that may go on, the child abuse or the sexual abuse or whatever, is, you know, unfortunate. But, you know, in the overall scheme of things, everything, you know, nothing can be so bad that it could be allowed to distract us from this greater thing that we are seeking to accomplish. Mm. And I, I think the thing that surprises me about Scientology, um, if you'll allow me uh, to just cut in there, is that whereas with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they their methods of manipulation, like you say, they're the same methods, essentially. Uh, right. You know, we're, we're talking about um, all manner of ways to deceive people um, and, and perpetuate an existing authority. And whereas with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the organization can be traced back to 1879 when the first watchtower was printed. Uh, so you have there, you know, 140 plus years of kind of organizational development where, you know, they may not have set out with certain policies and certain means of manipulation, but I think organically they just arrived at them because it, it's it's the easiest way to do things. Whereas mm -hmm. Scientology is obviously a much younger group starting in, what, the 1950s yep. and, and almost kind of hit the ground running with this stuff. Um, you know, it's almost like, OK, we know how to manipulate people. Let's just jump to this model of... <laughs> um of, of duping people and taking money out of their pockets you know yeah i i couldn't agree with you more and you know it's funny there's sort of an evolution because i've become pretty familiar with nixium and the the pattern and how keith ranieri went about doing his dirty deeds um you know the 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 stars of the Val, the HBO show about Nexium, Mark Vicente and, and his wife and Sarah Edmondson and Nippy have become very good friends of Christy and me. And we have talked to them a lot about Nexium. And, you know, I've watched everything that there is to watch and listened to every. Sarah and Nippy is. have been on the channel, actually. As have well. they yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, they I have. didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just did their podcast. It just dropped yesterday so mm. yeah it's like a little world of people who are engaged in this you know fight against coercive mind control but keith ranieri sort of took hubbard to the next level ranieri studied hubbard and 
took and refined the Hubbard, which was the refining of the things that had come before. And, you know, the, the speed with which he was able to put together uh, his organization and generate a lot of money and a lot of people coming in and supporting him was pretty remarkable. I mean, talk about hit the ground running. That was just like, he just went from zero to 60 in a year or two. Hubbard but, took, he also on. failed to do one thing that was his downfall, which was to call himself a religion. Right. <laughs> that, I was going to, I was going to say, because what, you know, you, 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 you say refined, and you know, I, I would agree. I mean, Nixium is uh, like Scientology on steroids, but um, I, I would argue there's there's only kind of so far you can go with the whole kind of cult leader thing um, before you go so far that you're actually uh, putting yourself at risk. Um, Hubbard, you know, died without having, I think, seen any time in jail, whereas Ranieri is very much in jail, uh, to my knowledge. <laughs> very much. So 100, I think, 120 years worth. Argu arguably, he went too far in in his refining. You know. <laughs> yes, that that is a really good point. He he mm. did, but you know, it, it's a testament to the power of the the ideas that you can inculcate inculcate into people to get them to do things that are against their fundamental nature, even against their best interests. Hmm. Because if you can persuade them that there is this, this greater accomplishment to be achieved somehow, if you can just, you know, sacrifice this, sacrifice that, sacrifice your free will, your your power of choice, your money, your time, whatever it is, you got to sacrifice. And if you if you can persuade someone that that sacrifice is going to be worth it in the end, you can get them to do all sorts of stuff. And you know, watching the watching the Keith Ranieri's of the world uh, and the L. Ron Hubbard's and the David Miscavige's is. Um, is really a study in in mental manipulation, how you go about manipulating people to get them to do what they really shouldn't be doing. And extreme narcissism, because, um, you know, it, it's one thing to be aware of the mechanisms of, of mind control and, and how to deceive people and how to, you know, amass a following uh, it's another thing entirely to put those into practice. I mean, if you if you or I, knowing what we know about cults, you know, didn't have any ethics whatsoever, um, we could probably further refine um, uh, so as to not go to jail and yet have all that money and all all of that power. But we we just don't want to because we're not psychopaths, you know. <laughs> so that's you kind that's of exactly right and and you know i say over and over and over people really need to read this wonderful book by martha stout called the sociopath next door because these people are not really i don't categorize them as narcissists i mean they are malignant mm. narcissists i put them into the next category of sociopath yeah where you know the those people have no conscience they don't they don't recognize um, pain or suffering in someone else. They don't recognize that anything out of them themselves is important. There is this wonderful line that that I think it was Nancy Saltzman says in the Val season two, where you know she had committed and devoted herself as Ranieri's loyal number two and biggest proponent, et cetera, et cetera. And she says, you know. I I all I have always loved, I just loved Keith. I loved I loved the man, and I thought he loved me back. 
And I finally came to realize there is only one person that Keith Raniere loves himself. And that is, is in a sentence, sort of the essence of what a sociopath is and what these cult leaders are. They are people who, who have no, they're not empathetic and yet they attract empaths. I, I talked to Mark Vicente a, quite a lot about this, about, you know, there are a lot of people, the Jehovah's Witnesses, like, I, you know, all of the former Jehovah's Witnesses I have met are all just such nice, wonderful, kind, caring people. And they didn't become nice, wonderful, kind, caring people just because they left the Jehovah's Witnesses. They were kind, nice, wonderful people to begin with. And it is the same with Scientologists. It is the same with people in Nexium. Those sociopaths attract empaths. They attract empaths because empaths are people who are looking to help other people. And that is one of the pitches that every good cult makes, which is not just you can help yourself, but we will teach you how to help other people. And that attracts empaths. And it is remarkable how many really nice, good, wonderful people there are who are involved in cults. It is a myth to have the idea that the only people that get involved in cults are the, you know, insecure, uh, desperate, needy, uh, unable to cope with society dregs. Mm. That is just not the case at all. Not yeah. by my experience. I, I do agree with you. However, <laughs> um, that what, what I have experienced, I, you know, in my 11 years of, of dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, is that while on the whole, I, I like to think the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses are, as you say, um, you know, kind, um, loving, you know, normal people who who don't set out to uh, do harm to others. Right. You obviously have um, a need for some level of um, narcissism or, um, you know, kind of, psychosis when we're when we're talking about the top brass about the leaders but I, I also think that um there are some things that i've heard some stories i've heard that where people kind of and when i say people i'm talking about kind of either ordinary witnesses or or just let's say congregation elders they go above and beyond in in their evil so it's not just a case of I'm doing this because, you know, there's there's been this guidance in this watchtower, or this is what it says in the Shepherd of Lock of God book, that they're going kind of one step further, um, and and I, I think I, I think there is there is at least an element of um, kind of sociopathic leaders attracting sociopathic people. Oh, I I, yeah. I completely agree with you, Lloyd. Yeah. I I'm not trying to make a generalization that yeah. every single person just to, like I don't agree with the generalization that everybody that's in a cult is uh, a broken individual yeah it, I, I was just trying to address that because yeah you you are absolutely right there is this other element of of the cultic world of the people who see this as an opportunity to, play out their innate evilness mm. uh, and they see that they um they can fit right into a pattern and and many times those are the people that rise to the top because they are very similar to the cultic leader mm. they have those same attributes and they see them and they see that they can take advantage of those so I 100% agree with you. I wasn't really 
trying to make the argument that every single no, no. person in a cult, except for the one guy at the top, yeah. is a good person. <laughs> yeah. Not the case. <laughs> Absolutely. And if I can, because you've you've said a lot about uh, Nixian, which, and I, I think it's wonderful. That's actually one of the things I most admire about both you and Leah is is that you're not just interested in in the group that's hurt you you know you, you have empathy and compassion for survivors of all cult like groups it's kind of how we came to know each other to begin with with the right. um, aftermath special on jehovah's witnesses and one abiding memory i have um from filming that with you and might i say that was kind of the highlight of, of my activism career you know being able to do come come to LA and, and and do that show and I can remember I don't know whether it made it on to the uh, final cut but I remember towards the end of filming there was a moment where we started talking about money because obviously Scientology is very much about money mm -hmm. you know hundreds of thousands of dollars you need to invest to kind of rise through go up the bridge Right. Um, of Scientology, whereas with with Jehovah's Witnesses, I remember telling you on set, you know, you could in theory not give a single dollar to Jehovah's Witnesses, and not only would they not know about it, but you you could actually rise all the way up in the organization, and because no one's checking your your bank balance or no one's expecting a check to come in you know, you could still kind of rise up the organization. And I remember both you and Leah being quite surprised at that and, and saying, well, you know, that, that kind of doesn't make any sense. And and I said, you know, so you have to remember sometimes it's just about control, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's one of the main, if I had to kind of isolate the main differences be between Scientology and Jehovah's Witnesses, I would say that that's a very stark one because... Um, the leadership impoverishes its members by dissuading them from going through higher education because right. they would rather have the the control. You know, they would rather have like a docile, subservient, uh, you know, pool of followers who aren't well educated and and don't know enough to question them. Right. I I, I recall that very vividly. It was it was it it. It was sort of shocking to me and to Leah. It was like, wow, how, how how does this work? But you know, you're right. The the money in Scientology and the money that is required to participate in Scientology is really a reflection of that same control and the ability to get people to do things that are against their best interests or their inherent nature and bankrupting people by, you know, crush selling them on, you know, give us all your money right now, take out a new mortgage, you know, uh, extend your credit cards, et cetera, et cetera, is just merely more of the, you know, we're going to make you do things that you don't think that you should really be doing. Um, mm in order to forward the cause. And it is exactly that same um, underlying reason behind it. Yeah. Uh, coming back to your your book, um, obviously, you know, you had something of a, a you know, a, a privilege in a way in being able to broadcast your story uh, not just on Scientology in the aftermath, which if you know viewers haven't checked that out yet, please do. Um, you know, multiple seasons we're able to learn more more about you personally and, and your story. But you know, you also featured on you know various um, documentaries. In fact, the first time I can remember ever being aware of you was was watching the BBC documentaries with John Sweeney, which. Mm -hmm were absolutely fascinating because you there was the the, the infamous encounter where uh you, you managed to break John Sweeney and get him to yell at you. Um so you've had already uh, you know a, a heck of a lot of publicity in terms of your personal story. So 
you know, what prompted you to take that extra step and say, you know what, um, I'm, I'm going to commit my life story to 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 paper, and I'm I'm going to go into this in more detail. What what take us through your thought process there? There were a lot of people who had said to me, "Oh, you need to write a book. You need to write a book." Because while um, there are snippets here and there about my experiences, they they weren't all in one place, mm -hmm. and it it was sort of. I viewed it as a very daunting task um, for two reasons. One, because it, it is a long story, a long period of time, and an enormous number of different things potentially to cover. And two, because I knew that Scientology has uh, incredibly detailed files of every day of my life, literally, and that if I got things wrong in the book, uh, that it would be, you know, shouted from the rooftops about how this is just a bunch of lies and, and the book would be tremendously discredited. And so I set about doing this many, many years ago, and I started writing an outline and sort of did this history, trying to recall everywhere I was and what was I doing at this time and where did I go then and then what happened and blah, Which blah, Which is blah. quite a challenge, isn't it? Because, you know, <laughs> when we're living our lives, we're not making notes for our future self so that we can kind of summarize what we were doing on a, on a given day. I can remember when I was writing my book, having to trawl through emails and, you know, dig through papers to find letters that I'd written just to kind of establish a, some kind of timeline of, of, of what happened. And it sounds like you had to do something similar. Exactly. But I had the disadvantage also, Lloyd, of when I, when I escaped from the Sea Org, I got nothing, no pictures. I don't have any photographs. I don't have any documents nothing none of that stuff was ever sent to me you so, didn't take any selfies in the hole or anything like that. exactly so. <laughs> yeah exactly uh you know even the pictures i had from the apollo or my wedding or family or anything none of those so it was it was sort of um a bit overwhelming but i kind of put it all together and then um christy my wife kept saying to me, you know, you got to sit down and actually write. And so I eventually started doing that, uh, you know, a few years ago, and I started writing and I, I wasn't very enthused about it. It was difficult. And I think that that uh, what finally prompted it um, outside of just the general, I would get emails and, and comments on my blog and why don't you write a book and blah, 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 was COVID because mm -hmm. I was sitting at home and couldn't do anything, couldn't go anywhere. And Christy is like, okay, time to get real. Sit down. You're not, go, you're not getting on any planes here, Mike. Come exactly. On. <laughs> you're not, you're not even going to the grocery store. <laughs> Let's get busy. Yeah. And so I did. And I wrote, um, you know, a, a first draft of the book. And then, you know, I wasn't especially happy with it um, in that. And, and Christy read it and a couple of friends read it. And Christy was like, there's not this is too dry. You've written this like a legal brief. Here is what happened. And then this happened. And then that happened. And then and she was absolutely right. And so I reached out and I found, well, I, I sort of arranged a, a, to get it published and had a publisher. And then they said, well, you need a book doctor. You don't need a ghost writer. You need someone to go through and, and sort of edit the book and help you get it into a form that is really going to make it publishable. And I got a bunch of recommendations from various people of, of these book doctors is what they call them. And I finally settled upon this woman who 
turned out to be someone who I consider a very good friend now, who was, uh, I called her an editor slash therapist. Because what she did was she read my manuscript and then would call me and we would sit on the phone for hours and she would say, tell me what you were feeling. What was going through your head at this point? How did this make, how, how did you react to that? Like dragging the, the emotion and thought processes out of the vaults of my hidden <laughs> mind, because you, you know, Lloyd, that in Scientology, emotion is something that is to be suppressed. I, I don't think it's just in Scientology, though, you know, at, at the risk of not being politically correct. I think sometimes guys in general have a problem with that, don't they? Oh, I, uh, I think that's true. Up. Yeah, I think that's true. But I think that there is that that the the idea that emotion uh, which in Scientology is called misemotion when it is considered to be inappropriate for the circumstance and mm. uh, distracting to production um, is is heavily suppressed. And even the training routines that get done in Scientology teach you to be very stoic and not react and not respond and not be. Uh, no outbursts, no upsets, no anger, no grief, no nothing. And so your and, your indoctrination as a Scientologist hindered your work as a writer. Absolutely. Absolutely. And but but credit to Kathy, who just is a, a wonderful person, she was exceedingly persistent and detailed and thorough and while she didn't write anything, she we would have these conversations, she would have them transcribed, and then she would make notes for herself and say, okay, when you're talking about this, you need to explain what you told me. You need to add this. You need to, uh, we need to reshuffle that because it's not clear from here that blah, blah, blah. And when you explained it to me, I got it so much more clearly. So. That was a tremendous, tremendous help. And I think it made the book um, much more relatable. Like a history of events in Scientology is sort of a meaningless thing. It, it, you know, it may have some academic value, but it certainly doesn't have much impact on the world at large. And I hope that this book has um the ability to reach people who know nothing about scientology and impart to them what a lot of people go through in their own lives and how you can somehow come out the other side of it i mean i want the message of this book to be Look, it's never too late to change. It's never too late to start your life over. No matter how shitty things seem to you in your job or your relationships or whatever is happening in your world, it can be different. And that is what, you know, I strived to accomplish. And I, you know, from the feedback that I've gotten from many, many people and and reviews and, you know, reviews on Amazon, that is something that uh, I feel like I have in, in some degree accomplished. And it makes me very happy to know that there are people out there who have now written to me and said, I read your book and it inspired me to what whatever it is to change to to get a, be a better relationship to end an abusive relationship to walk away from something that was making me unhappy whatever it is is wonderful and those messages and I'm sure you get them too Lloyd those messages make all of the shit that you have to take 
doing like doing the work that you do, the work that I do, we are are you know put a target on our backs. Hmm. But that target becomes like a a badge of honor when you hear from people who have been in some way helped by whatever you have done and it it you know you can take an awful lot of slings and arrows when you just have one person who tells you you helped me change my life or you saved me from x y and z and that's what is sort of important about the book to me. And, and yeah. just, I, I know I ramble a lot, Lloyd. I know I talk no, no, a lot, but I could know. listen to you ramble all day, to be honest, Mike. <laughs> but the other thing that... I want, I want to be able to have like a mic ambience on Spotify <laughs> that I can just switch on. And yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing, Lloyd, that was, that is really important to me about this book. And I know you haven't gotten it, so you haven't read it yet is that it is addressed to my children, the mm. children that I left in science, that I brought into Scientology and left there. Um, and that came about because when I was in the early stages of like, after I'd sort of put together this timeline and then I was trying to write the book I o over the years I've developed a pretty a pretty nice friendship with Larry Wright from when he wrote going author clear. of going clear yeah right and and he is an absolutely brilliant man and uh clearly the best author that I have ever met and the best writer that I have ever met and the best researcher that I have ever met, and one of the nicest guys that I have ever met. And I called him up and I said, Larry, give me your best advice. I am struggling here. I am like, people want me to write a book. I think I probably should. I don't know how they really go about it. What is your best advice? He said, my best advice. He said, what do you think my best book is? I said, I don't know, Looming Tower, Going Clear. I don't you know, uh, like I started rattling off all of his Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times best selling books. And he was like, nope, it's a book I wrote and published that was letters to my parents. And I'm most proud of that because it had it, it had the most meaning to me. Mike, write a book that is meaningful to you. I said, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of things that are kind of meaningful to me. And he said, oh, no, I think that, Mike, you need to, at least in your mind, address this to your children because they don't actually know you. They don't understand you. They don't know what your experiences have been. They don't know the decisions that you made and why you made them. And, and you... one of them, one of them has been trolling you for years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's her full time profession these mm. days. But you, you should take this opportunity to to really communicate the things that you want to communicate to them even if they read it after you're dead. Mm. And I said, okay, I, that, that gives me a purpose. And I actually took it one step further and addressed the book to them. And there is a letter to them that is the beginning of the book. You know, dear Taryn and Benjamin, sorry about your life. Here is what, here, here is why I've written this book. Hopefully someday you'll read it. Uh, it's a little more detailed than that, but um, that is yeah. That, that that's that you're not selling the book very well at this point, Mike. I'm sorry, it's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that sounds that sounds like an amazing start to a book. In, in yeah, seriousness, yeah, yeah. And and so you know, there's the story of the book, Lloyd, uh, mm. as best I can, as best I can tell it.
Mm. And it, it takes on, um, according to one review that I read, that it takes on the kind of the feel of a thriller at one point. And uh, I'm, <clears throat> that makes me even more excited to read it because, I, again, when I when I first encountered you as a person, it was on the BBC documentaries with John Sweeney. And I think on one of them, um, you and Marty Rathburn, um, bless him, were on the run essentially we're, we're just kind of escaping from from the church and it felt very it felt almost like a born film you know and uh as someone who was just going through the process of waking up from jehovah's witnesses at that point it was really really interesting to kind of see how extreme cults can get and have some kind of point of of comparison in, in, in fact i remember somehow getting hold of going clear Again, it's hard to to get books in Croatia. You have to wait like a month or, or so. But um, yeah, I, I got hold of, of going clear and again, could see all of the mechanisms, but could also see, you know, areas in which, you know, things were taken to it to an extreme, you know. So, um, you know, what what's it been like sharing more of that element of your story, the actual escape itself? Um. Well, it get it's it's uh, it's interesting because people are kind of gripped by that, mm. and you know my story of escape isn't even as dramatic as some others. You know, Valerie Haney escaped. Yeah, you, you from weren't the in the boot of a car at any point, exactly, um, <laughs> and and I wasn't like sliding down the the ropes of the free winds to the dock and running for freedom. Uh, but it was um, sort of harrowing, I guess, and and that was something else that that when you know Kathy, my book doctor, first read the manuscript, I'd written that little section about the final days, and and in fact, the book starts with that. It's a letter to my children, and then it starts with the day that I escaped, and then sort of backtracks to how did I get to there? And then subsequently what happened? Um, and she was like, oh my God, I this was like, my heart was pounding. I, you know, they're following you and you're escaping on the tube. And, you know, because I was in London when, uh, you know, John Sweeney, the, the person you mentioned, who's become a very dear friend of mine. And in fact, I follow him on Twitter, and yeah, his, his stuff from Kiev has just been amazing. Yeah, he is a crazy man. That guy is a crazy man, <laughs> and 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 the funniest, crazy, nicest. but in a good way. Yeah. Yes, yeah, <laughs> crazy, crazy. Like I said to him, John, what are you doing in Kiev? Why, why, <laughs> why do you feel like you have to go there? I don't know. That's where things are happening. You know, yeah. he goes and doorsteps. Putin and Trump and arrested by the how he's know, still alive. I have no pa idea. But, Pakistani yeah. security forces and like this yeah. guy has experiences beyond experiences, mm. but he played a significant role in my eventually escaping. And I happened to be in London at the time doing that panorama show or having done that panorama show and then trying to to deal with the fallout from it and john sweeney's um sort of infamous or famous interview uh attempt of me in the doorway of the tottenham court road scientology testing center where he asked me about the physical abuses of David Miscavige and I threatened him with lawsuits and told him he was a, a liar and blah, 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 was a very um, significant moment in my decision-making process that a couple of weeks later resulted in me getting out the door. Oh, right. So going, even though you were at the time kind of leaping almost instinctively to the defense of Scientology, what you're saying is that seeds were being sown and there was like an, an internal conflict. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I detail that at some length in the book, mm -hmm. because of course, this was one of the things that Kathy was like, 
okay, so even after this happened, after you're in the hole, after this, after that, after this abuse and that abuse, you're still there. Why did you stay? Why, like, why couldn't you get yourself out of this mess? And so a lot, I spent a lot of time trying to explain the thought processes and the conflicts and the things that, that like, yeah, but if this, then that, if that, the consequences of this and the consequences of that. But you are exactly right. That moment, I went, I sort of went, you know what? This isn't why I became a Scientologist or joined the Sea Org. I did not, I, I, I can't believe I am now standing here defending this guy who is physically assaulting me and others. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Because it, it's not like it was just like hearsay. You know, when, when you've got personal experience of him, of him assaulting you, Right. You know, and, and that and it's your job to say, oh, he'd never do something like that. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and I'm yeah. like, well, you know, lying on behalf of Scientology to the media to not expose the operating Thetan levels because Hubbard says that that will be harmful to people is justified in my mind as a good Scientologist. And you know, and I talk about that too, going on, you know, national TV with Katie Couric, and she's asking me about the Xenu and OT3 story. And I'm like, ha, ah, no, nothing like that. No, no, no. And I, that to me was well justified and explained. And then I'm like, but why am I defending uh, this? idiot who's just a little sociopath that ah, is so it wasn't if it was the the religion and for want of a better word it's theology it's theology that was one thing but when it was an individual you know that was something else and was... and an individual that was not doing something based on the theology mm. not doing something based on fundamental scientology principles but mm. just being an asshole. Mm. And now here I am lying on the BBC about what's really going on. And I'm, and I, you know, it wasn't the only thing. It was just one of the last straws. And the very last straw happened a few, few weeks later. And you can read about that in the book. Yeah. Don't uh, spoil was, it. Yeah. What, what actually happened that I then, literally walked out the door and escaped and so yeah john john and the bbc and and things in in that realm had a big impact on me and uh it's wonderful that i have retained a friendship with him and also the producer of those two two bbc panorama shows sarah sure. mole who is a wonderful person um, and you know, I, I look back and I go, wow, there are so many things that, that happened in, in the course of this sort of adventure of becoming a Scientologist, joining the Sea Org, of finally getting out and then what's happened subsequently. Mm. That it is, um, you know, someone said to me, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say something to you after reading your book that, it, and I want you to take it as a compliment. This is not meant as a, as any, in anything other than a compliment. You know, Mike, you are the Forrest Gump of Scientology. You were, I would not take that as a compliment at all. But yeah, go on. <laughs> he said, you were somehow at the every significant event that occurred in uh, the history of Scientology. You were somehow there. You were somehow involved with it. I don't know how you managed to be everywhere doing everything. All, like, it just is is amazing. And you know, I look back and 
the the biggest challenge that ended up apart from me getting the thought processes and emotion in the book was what do I leave out? Because there is just so much more that could have been in there, but it would just be too long and too much, you know, inside baseball kind of stuff about things. You know, I go on podcasts and I, I, I particularly when I talk to, uh, you know, Aaron and Mark Headley on their weekly YouTube channel, always stuff comes up and they're like, I never knew that before. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, sorry. I, you know. <laughs> Why were you fit- keeping this from us all these years? Yeah. <laughs> couldn't fit, couldn't fit it in the book. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, last time I had you on the show, it, it wasn't that long after the aftermath. Um, but you hadn't yet, I don't think at that point you'd started the Fair Game podcast. So there's been the Fair Game podcast since you were last on this channel. There's obviously been your book. Um, in my experience, the thing with cults is that they're changing continu- continually because mm-hmm. that you know they're, they're frequent, they're constantly having to adapt uh, to survive. Um, and so it's got to the point where with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, the religion is almost unrecognizable from how it was when I left around 2010, 2011. Um, how has Scientology changed over the last few years? Because, uh, you know, my perception of Scientology is that it's it's essentially kind of a brand without a following. You know, we're, we're talking what ten, fifteen thousand followers. Um, that that their bark is is louder, is is worse than their bite. Essentially, that they're they're about real estate and they're about um, pulling money out of a very very small membership. Um, and whereas with Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, that they they truly do number into the millions. So. What's what's kind of changed with Scientology? I'm thinking, for example, you know, there's been the whole Danny Masterson uh, lawsuit, which sounds like it's been horrendously complicated. You know, ha, ha, what's what's the what does the landscape of Scientology uh, look like now compared to, let's say, three or four years ago? You said something, um, Lloyd, that is, you know, you talk about the evolution or evolving or changing uh, according to circumstances. And that's something Scientology has a very, very difficult time accomplishing. And the reason for that is because it is based on the writings of L. Ron Hubbard. And in Scientology, those things uh, are literally the word of God. They can't be changed. And so Scientology tends to be stuck in its ways and methods and operations. And the only things that um, force change is some some degree of, um, of adjusting things based on public perception or, you know, bad public relations. So when a lot of exposure happened about women being coerced into having abortions in the Sea Org, they stopped doing that. Well, it was never a Hubbard policy to begin with that that should be the case. So they could adjust that. The problem that they have more generically is that they can't change the the things that are dictated by Hubbard. So they can't change the fact that they must seek to destroy their enemies and discredit them. And even though it brings about enormous ill will and nowadays bad public relations for Scientology, they just keep doing it. And Scientology is is dwindling and the number of members is decreasing steadily primarily because they can't change Mm. because they can't do anything different. And secondarily, because 
the the poison for Scientology and all cults is information. And in the information age that we live in now, where you can, you know, nobody buys a pair of shoes without Googling what sort of shoes should I buy or toothpaste brand. It's very, very difficult for Scientology to, to foist off the pretense of what it is to new people without them having the ability to quickly Google and you Google Scientology and it is not pretty. They mm. pay for ads to appear at the top of Google searches, but it, you know, nobody clicks on a paid ad on a Google search. I mean, and uh, other than inadvertently, it just isn't what, it isn't what anybody that knows how to use I Google I often inadvertently does. click on things in Google searches. So yeah. Um. Yeah, but inadvertently, <laughs> so do I. But then you get, then you realize what it is and you're yeah. out of there back yeah. to the actual search. So yeah. that has been devastating to Scientology. And I, I'm sure devastating to every other, you know, coercive mind control organization that there is. Um, but the, the fundamental problem that Scientology has is they still are promising things that Hubbard promised in 1950 in Dianetics, you know, clears won't get colds, you'll throw away your glasses, you'll, you know, you'll be able to cure yourself of, of virtually all illnesses and disease, and they can't change that. And in, in this day and age, when people go and just do a quick search and go, oh, tell me about Dianetics, it's like, huh, really, that's what it says? Oh, and really? And so it's, it's, it's doomed to a, you know, dwindling into nothing, but they've accumulated an awful lot of money and assets that will keep them going for a very, very long time. Um, and as you know, Lloyd, even like, for the diehard cult member, adversity or things going really bad or the predictions of the, you know, coming of Armageddon not coming true, or in the case of Scientology, the clearing of the planet not happening, they don't tend to discourage the, the hardcore cult mind they tend to motivate the hardcore cult mind to come up with an explanation as to why this isn't, uh, why this didn't happen, why it isn't happening. And then we've got to work harder. We've got to try harder. God is testing us. Whatever the explanation is, it, the adversity and failure and, and, the exposure even of the fallacies is something that that motivates people to get more devout and more yeah. active and more frantic and dedicated to achieving the objectives that have been laid out. So there must be something special about Scientology because look at all this flack that we're taking, you know. Is essentially what what you're describing, and what you've also very helpfully done is highlight another key kind of divergence from Jehovah's Witnesses. We've already talked talked about the money aspect and the fact that you could you know rise through the ranks in Jehovah's Witnesses without parting with a dollar um, theoretically, uh, but you've also really helpfully for me. Um, brought my attention to the fact that there is no quote unquote new light in Scientology. So, um, whereas in Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, what you've described, it would be like if um, the writings of Joseph Rutherford were considered as scripture, and and we had to 
kind of carry on reading them even though they're talking about all sorts of crazy stuff about well basically anti-semitism and um all sorts of hateful rhetoric and nonsense about uh, ending prohibition and and all that kind of thing because he was a raging alcoholic um so it, it, you know jehovah's witnesses have this thing called new light where as long as everything they can roughly justify things based on the bible they can they can change their their teachings on a whim you know mm -hmm. um and it it seems as though scientology doesn't have that wiggle room based on what you're saying no and and that is is uh something that will ultimately be its demise i mean the the mormons the latter day saints have the same thing you know they have revelations and suddenly you know oh it's a okay. black people are okay now you know mm. it, it, and this, this is not the case in scientology it, it just there's no mechanism for that um although david miscavige has over the the 30 years that he has been running scientology now and he has actually been running scientology for longer than l ron hubbard believe it or not i can believe it yeah he he has sort of become a, a like to begin with everybody in scientology was like oh there will never be another l ron hubbard and david miscavige is just like taking on the mantle of l ron hubbard but he is not in any way shape or form a replacement for you you for the first 10 years of david miscavige's reign over scientology he would say nothing other than i'm doing what ron says or this is what lrh says or this is what and gradually over time miscavige calls himself the chairman of the board cob now it has become cob says cob we do what cob is directing us to do because he is following what hubbard said but it's become not just we're doing what Hubbard said. We're doing what COB says because he does what Hubbard said. And this there's a bit of animal farm here, isn't there? With the, yes. the writing on the on the wall, yeah, being changed. This, yeah. This <laughs> subtle shift has been occurring. But the problem is that though Miscavige could probably get away with a kind of gentler version of Scientology, like he could probably persuade the followers of Scientology at this point that we should we should do away with the the disconnection policy, for example, or we should not be charging so much for our, you know, whatever it was that that were the reforms that would make Scientology less abusive. That's not his nature. That that. The problem is that he is a sociopath. Mm. So he wants to be able to get people to do things against their best interests. That power is what Just for the hell of it. him. That, yeah. That's that's what sociopaths are. Mm. They they want the the control over people to dominate and dictate and and be able to get people to do things that are against their best interests. And they're not going to change the, you know, something because it's abusive towards someone. That that just doesn't enter their their mind. So, you know, while I believe that at this point Miscavige could change things if he wanted to, he doesn't. Yeah. Um, he's a very, very interesting character. And of course, we don't know where he is at the moment, do we? Nor nor do <laughs> no. we know where his wife is. Well, um, well, we sort of do know where he is, and we sort of do know where his wife is, but his wife hasn't been seen publicly since 2007. And he um, shows up in places and does things, but then pretends that he isn't there and has a, an army of lawyers and minions who say, oh, ho, ho, no, we have no idea where he is. Nothing they, to see here, folks. I'm imagining we, that. Um, yeah, 
yeah and mean. that's exactly right he's like <laughs> he's like the wizard of oz behind his curtain and there's nobody here there's nobody here yeah uh, so but that probably will come to an end on friday when there is a hearing that that i think that the court will probably conclude that he is just playing games at this point so let's we'll hope see. um yep. I, you've prompted me to ask a question because again i'm i'm trying to rather than finding the commonalities in this conversation i'm trying to find the differences if that makes sense sure and so we've already talked about money and the fact that scientology doesn't really have new light um, another big, big difference is we've just talked about David Miscavige and the fact that he's now been ruling over Scientology for longer than L. Ron Hubbard did. Um, with Jehovah's Witnesses, you have this old old guys club where you know they get to just pick their mates, and and when one pops his clogs, they just draft in another or another two, and they can just constantly replenish the leadership with people who are tried and trusted when it comes to perpetuating the organization and its teachings. What happens if Miscavige dies? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, all he he has basically disappeared all of his potential rivals or people who thought were in some way a threat to his power, including his wife, Shelly. Mm. Um, but those people are still around. They're still, you know, kept in, in, you know, hermetically sealed boxes somewhere that, that they are not in contact in with the outside world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and they're, they're, um, you know, have been basically beaten into submission and they are pretty much jellyfish at this point. But as I said on the, the podcast, oh, uh, on the YouTube with Mark and Aaron last night, you know, in, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And if Miscavige was to get run over by a bus or had a cardiac arrest tomorrow, one of those people would rise above the slime and become the chief jellyfish and mm. would appear and be now anointed as, you know, well, he's not a replacement for COB, but he's, you know, running the show now. Um, Caretaker COB. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. CCOB. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, they, they, any one of those people, pretty much that that may you know have the sort of cred to be able to reappear in the Scientology world and be treated seriously. People who were formerly pretty public, you know, the Guillaume Lasserve, who was the executive director international, or Ray Midoff, who was the senior case supervisor international any one of those people um are, are not sociopathic personalities so that would probably be good for scientology if one of those people were to take over and try and um you know make Scientology a kind of gentler activity. It'd be nice if there was a jellyfish that took over that's not a sociopath. Correct. But mm. that is a two-edged sword because the beauty of Miscavige in some ways is that he is driving this bus over a cliff and that is going at an accelerated rate. And the demise of Scientology is faster and greater because of him. And I am afraid that it might stretch out longer if someone else took over. So, so weirdly, you're a, you're a Miscavige fan. Uh, weird, There's weirdly, a bombshell. Weirdly, there you go. <laughs> the, the bombshell reveal. You're rooting for him, Mike. You're rooting <laughs> for him. So on that bombshell, I think we'll leave it there. But um, again, uh, I'm, I, I hugely admire everything that you've been doing over the years to not just highlight the abuses of Scientology, but to highlight the abuses of cults in general. I, I think the work that you and, and others, including Mark, 
um, uh, including Leah and, and various other uh, activists are doing is absolutely astounding and greatly assists um, those of us in other spheres of the cult world. Um, so thank you for writing uh, A Billion Years. And I very much look forward to reading reading it. And I hope to have you back on the channel someday because I, I love talking to you. Well, well, we'll do it once you've got the book and read it. How about that? That's a deal. That's a deal. I'll let you know. I'll have you back and I'll I'll drill you on my thoughts and see if I can find any holes. <laughs> I, I, doubt, I doubt it, though. Um, but, Mike, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure for me too, Lloyd. Viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this interview. Don't forget that you can watch more, more such interviews and videos by subscribing to the Lloyd Evans channel. But for now, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for watching.